One of the things that Artemisia Gentileschi is very famous for are her paintings of Judith and Holofernes. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story and show you a, f a few paintings uh, so you can sort of get the uh, historical context of this. Uh, Artemisia painted four different paintings of Judith and Holofernes. Um, and so first we want to tell you the story. Uh, this is a Bible story. It's from the book of Judith. Uh, if you uh, have uh, a modern Protestant Bible, you will not find the, Judith, uh, the book of Judith in that book. It has been removed from Protestant Bibles. Now, it wasn't immediately removed from Protestant Bibles. It's in the Luther Bible, the Luther translation of the Bible. Um, and I understand up until the 11th or 12th edition of the King James or authorized version of the Bible uh, still contained uh, what are now called the apocryphal books. Um, but eventually, uh, many of the Protestants removed certain books from the Bible. They removed the book of Maccabees, Tobit, uh, the Wisdom books, and the book of Judith. Um, but it's a wonderful story, um, and essentially it is, um, it reminds me in some ways of the story of David defeating Goliath. Um, and so essentially you could say she's a female David. She saves her city, not from the Philistines, but from the Assyrians. So Judith is a chaste and virtuous widow. And she has been in seclusion, I forget how long, I think it's three years, uh, mourning the death of her husband. Her city of Petula is besieged by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are um, some of the most cruel of the warriors of the ancient world. They're known for going out and uh, coming to a city and say, surrender or we'll kill every living thing. And then when the city doesn't surrender and the Assyrians defe de defeat them, uh, they'll go in and kill every living thing. Um, the Bible doesn't talk about that, but they just say the Assyrians. So uh, we presumably know that. So the city of Betula, a Hebrew city, is being besieged by the Assyrians. And it looks bad. But Judith comes out of her period of mourning and decides that she has a plan that she can save her city. And she washes herself, she bathes, she puts on her beautiful clothes again, and she goes out in, uh, she goes out of the city and goes to the Assyrian camp. And she takes her maidservant with her. She also takes food, which I thought that should have tip them off because, of course, uh, Jewish dietary laws mean that she can't eat Assyrian food. Um, so she, uh, she goes to the camp and she presents herself as a traitor. Uh, she tells them that she knows a secret way into the city and she will show them the way if they will spare her and her family. Well, the Assyrian general Holofernes is much taken with this beautiful young lady uh, and he thinks, okay, this is it. Uh, and uh, he, you know, he gives permission for her to go out and pray, and he's, you know, permission for her eat, to eat her own kosher food, we'd say today. Um, but he invites her to a banquet, and that's when she explains that she's brought her own food. Uh, he invites her to a banquet, and it turns out it's a banquet with two people, just him and Judith. Uh, and uh, the Holofernes proceeds to get very drunk, uh, thinking he's going to have his way with this lovely lady. Uh, and he falls down drunk, uh, and uh, Judith takes his sword and cuts off his head. And then she and the maidservant put it in a sack. And they go out uh, back to the city, because remember, she's been given permission to go out and pray, so that's what everybody thinks she's doing, is back to the city. The next morning, the Assyrians go to wake their general, thinking it's the last day of the siege, and they found their army literally without a head. They look over to the battlements of Batula. They see Holofernes' head displayed. They are struck with fear. The Hebrew army comes out of the city and chases the Assyrians from the field. And from there on, it sounds really very much like um, the Hebrews chasing the Philistines. And uh, everyone gives thanks and praise to God. It's very much like, like uh, the aftermath of the story of David and Goliath. But you'll notice Judith and her maidservant are taking much greater risks than David does. David stands back and throws stones at Goliath. And if he were to be killed, it would probably be one very swift uh, sword stroke. If Judith and her maidservant were discovered, they would probably be raped to death. Um, 
they would certainly be tortured to death. So they take great risks by going directly into the enemy camp. Now, what I want to do is show you some pictures of Judith and Holofernes. Uh, they're just, it's a very popular theme. And these are the, the names of the ones that uh, are by Artemisia Dentaleschi. We see Judith decapitating Holofernes, which was a painting that was done for the King of Naples uh, in 1612 to 13. Uh, the Duke of Florence wanted his own copy, so there is a painting in the Uffizi, although it uh, doesn't seem to be on display. I think it's in the Vasari Corridor, which is open only once a year for about a month in March. Uh, and we see Judith decapitating uh, Holofernes. Uh, and then we see the picture of Judith and their maidservant from the Pity, uh, very close up. And then a wonderful painting in Detroit, uh, which is the one I showed you before, I'll show you again, uh, with Judith and their maidservant, once again, um, uh, with the head of Holofernes. So here we're seeing the painting of Judith decapitating Holofernes from Naples. Um, it is a violent, uh, powerful scene. And as you can see, Holofernes uh, has wakened up as his throat is being sl slashed. Uh, maidservant and Judith are both holding him down. The blood is spurting. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bloody, gory picture. Uh, but it certainly uh, ha is a powerful painting. And uh, Judith really looks strong, she looks powerful, and it looks like she's about her work. I mean, she's, she's uh, determined that this person is not going to harm her city. Uh, this is the version, uh, you can see the colors are changed just slightly, uh, and uh, this is the version that is in uh, the Uffizi, uh, that, that's the main picture gallery in Florence. Uh, and it was a copy that was commissioned by the Duke of Florence. It's a, a variant, it's a, not exactly the same, but the same thing. You can see the spurting blood and uh, the, the pressure that the women are uh, putting on uh, Holofernes uh, as they are, going to, they are going to kill him in order to save their city. The picture in the Pity Palace is a very close-up view of Judith and their maidservant. They've got the, the, uh, the uh, head of Holofernes, as you can see, the maidservant seems to have him in a kind of basket, and they're looking over their shoulders. Uh, this could be inside the tent, or it could be after they have left, and they are uh, you know, retreating and going back to the city and uh, looking, looking over their shoulder to see if anybody's following them, perhaps. This is the painting in Detroit. Um, it shows the moment after the deed has been done. Holofernes' head has been severed, and the maidservant is putting it in a bag, essentially. Um, this is taking place in Holofernes' tent. It's, uh, this is what we talked about with tenebrism. It's very dark, it's a night scene, and it's illuminated with a candle, which sends a very dramatic light on the two women. What you're seeing is a scene that is not in the Bible story, but it's something that someone who really thought about would understand. It's a moment of intense vulnerability. They've cut off Holofernes' head. Uh, they're still in the tent. They haven't escaped yet. And you can just imagine that they've heard a sound outside a tent, the tent. Maybe the soldiers are walking by. Maybe somebody's approaching the tent. They don't know if anybody's going to come in and catch them. It's that you know, terrifying moment. No one else has portrayed that moment but Artemisia Gentileschi. It's like that it's something that's just very, very real and gives you the feeling, you know, not just, oh, these are great heroes, or yes, they're very powerful, or any of the other interpretations, which we'll see some more. Um, it shows their danger, and it shows what they risked. And it's, um, it is an extremely powerful painting. There's a detail of the head of Holofernes There's a golden yellow that uh, Artemisia uses, and it's now known as Artemisia gold. And uh, so we see her using that in this picture. Now, I wanted to show you some other ways of showing Judith and Holofernes. Um, there's a long tradition of interpreting this, uh, this uh, story allegorically. In the Middle Ages, and uh, certainly part of the Renaissance in the 15th century, 
Uh, Judith was one of the examples of what the Bible calls the strong women. And uh, people like Judith or Esther, you know, who uh, risked their lives uh, to save their people. Uh, Mary was also considered one of the strong and virtuous women of the Bible. And uh, one of the things that the Christians would often do is they would look at the Old Testament and find uh, what they call prefigurations or types of different Bible stories or different Bible figures so that God was giving um, signs or omens throughout history uh, about what was going to happen in the Christian era. This is how they thought of it. Um, and sometimes you'll see these uh, books. There's uh, the Biblia Pauperum or the Speculum Humanae Salvationis, the, mir the Bible of the Poor, or the Mirror of Human Salvation, where they'll have pictures, um, manuscript or woodcut pictures, uh, with Old Testament scenes uh, next to the New Testament scenes uh, for which the Old Testaments are the type. Um, so Judith is a type, an Old Testament type, for Mary defeating the devil or Mary defeating evil. Um, sometimes Judith is seen as an allegory of virtue conquering vice, obviously Holofernes is vice, or chastity overcoming lust, or as we'll see in one instance, humility overcoming pride. So she's a virtue overcoming a vice, uh, allegorically. Starting in the 16th century, and then a lot of them in the 17th century, you start to see some pictures of Judith where she's this sexy female with uh, not many clothes on or very low cut, her breasts are showing, or sometimes her whole body. And she becomes kind of this femme fatale who tricks the man into his death, uh, which is not really the biblical story. <laughs> it's a woman who's risking uh, everything uh, in order to save her people. Um, but it seems like it's okay if the male does that and is the hero, but if a woman does it, they're not in their place. So there's some, um, an uncomfortable interpretation and uh, a somewhat negative interpretation becomes applied to Judith. It's been suggested, we're not, I'm not sure of this, uh, but it has been suggested that it's also been used as a uh, Reformation uh, allegory either the Reformation overcoming Catholicism, uh, which one person has suggested for uh, some paintings by Lucas Cronick, which we'll see, uh, or uh, a counter-Reformation image of the Catholic Church defeating the Protestant heresy. So let's look at some of these earlier examples. Uh, Montaigne uh, in the 15th century uh, shows Judith as the strong and virtuous woman. Uh, in this case, you know, she is uh, vertical, uh, dressed in classical garments. There's nothing uh, overtly sexual about her. Uh, we can just, there's not a lot of gore either. The, the uh, dead body of Holofernes is, is back in the tent and uh, she is uh, just placing the uh, head in this sack that the maidservant is holding. Montaigne, he did a number of versions of this. This is another one where uh, it's painted to look like a stone relief with very, very classical clothing. Uh, so Montaigne was one of the most classical of the 15th century artists. You see that here, he's applied it to a biblical story. And so once again, she's shown as a strong woman, very heroic. Uh, one of the most famous 15th century images of Judith is a uh, bronze statue that originally was a fountain, uh, it seems, because there's spigots there, but it, we also know it was also placed outside the Palazzo Vecchio, or the old palace, the city hall of Florence. Uh, it originally was a Medici um, a commission, and it was originally in the, um, the, probably in the garden of the Medici palace. Uh, it has been interpreted as an allegory of lust, of, of uh, chastity overcoming lust, Holofernes being the lust. Uh, but there's an inscription on the statue, and it th defines it as an allegory of humility cutting off the head of pride. So we see Judith, once again, completely dressed as a chaste and virtuous woman. She's, she has, she's got a veil, she's completely garbed, uh, raising the sword. Uh, to slice off the head of the uh, completely drunk, or maybe he's dead now, uh, 
general Holofernes. In the 16th century, we start to see these sexy uh, paintings of Judith. Here or somewhere there, Jan Metzies, uh, son of Quentin, Quentin Metzies, is showing you Judith in a transparent garment over the top half of her body. Uh, Jan von Hamessen goes even further. She's removed all of her clothes. You'll notice she's very muscular, very Michelangelo-esque. Uh, this, incidentally, is Katharina von Hamessen's father. So um, you can see some of the work that he was doing. With the uh, classicism has come to uh, Antwerp. And here are two images that I, I, I can't say for certain, but I have sometimes seen uh, identified as, as Reformation and Counter-Reformation images. Uh, on the left, you have a picture uh, of, uh, by Lucas Cronick, uh, who was a good friend of Martin Luther and seems to have really created a lot of Protestant uh, iconography. Uh, in this case, there's nothing necessarily to say is Protestant. I mean, it's a biblical story. And uh, we see Judith and her maid servant in the tent, uh, wearing very fashionable clothing, and uh, putting the head of Holofernes in the sack while the Assyrian army is outside and unsuspecting. Um, there is one book which has suggested that this may be a Reformation image. Uh, that Judith is considered to be the, uh, the virtuous figure, so for the uh, Protestant Reformation, uh, overcoming uh, what they see as the uh, flaws in uh, Catholicism. The other example that I have uh, to show you, Let's see. Here we see Lucas Chronic, Judith in the Assyrian camp. Werner Schrede has suggested that this should be read as a Reformation allegory with Judith, Judith uh, as uh, the virtuous Protestants and Holofernes as those uh, bad Catholics. Uh, you can, of course, turn this around. Uh, I saw this painting in the museum. Uh, and the placard on the side of it did a little explanation, and uh, I don't know their source, but they suggested that this might be a counter-reformation allegory. Vouvet was a French artist, so he and his patrons are going to be Catholic, and in this case, uh, Judith is symbolizing the virtuous Catholics uh, who are overcoming the evil Protestant heretics uh, who are Hall of Fair names. So um, it's a possibility, it could be interpreted that way. Uh, one of the most famous images of Caravaggio from the Baroque period, excuse me, one of the most famous images of Judith from the Baroque period is Caravaggio's painting of Judith. And it's probably pretty certain that Artemisia Gentileschi saw this. Um, it's now in, it's on the second floor of the Barberini Palace, which is part of the uh, Galleria Nazionale, the National Gallery in Rome. Uh, and as you can see, uh, Judith uh, is slicing off <laughs> Holofernes' head. Uh, there's blood spurting out from the artery. Uh, he seems to be trying to cry out, but nobody can hear him, presumably, because his trachea has already been cut. And uh, she is uh, standing to one side so the blood doesn't get all over her, uh, with a kind of uh, worried look on her face, like, oh, little pink tear. Uh, and of course, in this case, we see an elderly maidservant. You'll notice the maidservant sometimes is youthful, sometimes elderly. Uh, and in the case of the Montaigne, they see, she seems to be African. Here's our comparison. Uh, as I say, um, Artemisia must have seen uh, Caravaggio's image because we have that idea of the, uh, certainly the blood spurting in uh, Artemisia, the blood is spurting everywhere. It's spurting in the direction of uh, the assassins as well as all over the bed. So it's a, a bit more dramatic. And in this case, the woman has a very different um, uh, facial expression. <laughs> uh, she seems determined. She seems powerful. And certainly not, ooh, I don't want to get blood on my beautiful clothing, and I'm so sweet and proud. You know, uh, this, is, this is a powerful Judith <laughs> that uh, Artemisia has created. And here, of course, we see the example that I've, I showed you before uh, with Arezzo uh, having uh, somewhat a similar image. Uh, the idea almost that they've cut off the head and they're looking around, is someone going to discover them? And yet what Artemisia does with that image is just so totally... Um, it's much more powerful, stronger. It makes you worried about them. Uh, 
And there is another, uh, this one uh, by Arezzo is in uh, Hartford, uh, Connecticut. Uh, and there's a very similar version, not quite as brightly colored or neutral tones, that's in the Vatican. And that's been attributed both to Arezzo and uh, also has been considered a possible copy after the Arezzo by Artemisia. But it's you know so, so close, um, it's very hard to say. Um, this is a very interesting and in many ways very original painting uh, of an allegory of painting. It's known as La Pictura, um, and it dates from 1630. It is usually considered to be a self-portrait of Artemisia Gentileschi. It is usually considered to be a self-portrait of Artemisia Gentileschi. And um, I just recently read that some people are perhaps doubting that. Um, but I think we'll just keep this as the idea that it is a self-portrait uh, with the caveat that we may be wrong about this. Um, but it's a very, very interesting painting. Uh, as you can see, the, the point of view, when you're looking down on the figure, uh, creates this very interesting negative shape. The negative shape is the shape around the figure, sort of the background shape. And then the figure itself is in a very unusual and interesting shape uh, that forms a kind of a strong, powerful diagonal. And diagonals often uh, imply action, movement, uh, excitement, drama. I always want to say dramatic diagonals. Um, it shows a woman, presumably Artemisia, uh, drawing or painting, actually, on a canvas that has been um, prepared with a reddish-brown ground. Uh, that was a technique that Titian used to use, and other artists obviously did as well, to give warmth to their colors. One of the things that's fascinating to me about uh, that particular point of view where you're looking down is that it always seems to me that Artemisia is centuries ahead of her time because in the 19th century, Degas would do this unusual point of view where you were looking down on, for example, uh, ballerinas. And it's often um, remarked how, how uh, innovative that is. Uh, Mary Cassatt does it sometimes, too, having an uh, unusual point of view where you're looking down on the figure. Artemisia Gentileschi had done it uh, all those centuries before. Now, one of the interesting things about this is it's considered to be an allegory of painting. In Italian, um, la pittura, which is the name that we give the painting, uh, we mean literally the painting, although uh, in uh, many Romance languages they use the article, the, uh, in times that we might not, we would just say painting. So um, let me say la pictura. Pictura is a feminine noun. It ends in an A. Uh, and like many Romance languages and other languages as well, uh, Italian has both feminine and masculine nouns. Um, so there are many pictures of, by male artists where they show an allegory of painting, usually a male artist painting, sometimes uh, painting a woman who uh, might be painting or might be fame or something like that. Um, but since pictura itself is a feminine noun, we have this interesting um, visual with the painting and linguistic uh, concept that only a woman artist can embody painting. So she is both the allegorical figure of painting, uh, pictura, as well as the painter herself. I have just a few more pictures to show you without too much commentary. Um, this is a painting uh, by Artemisia Gentileschi. Formerly, you would see it identified as fame. Uh, it's an allegorical figure, and there is, it's hard to see because of the tenebrism. Uh, it's reproduced uh, very darkly, but there is a trumpet in it. Uh, it has since then been, uh, the, had been re-identified as Cleo, the muse of history. Uh, there is, uh, I think, a copy of Thucydides here, which would certainly identify her as uh, history. Uh, and the trumpet is sometimes associated with history as well as fame, presumably the famous people in history. And here we see a, a late picture by her, uh, the birth of John the Baptist. Uh, one interesting thing is Artemisia did have male pupils. Um, and uh, sometimes she had to struggle. But 
her work is so very, very powerful, and I'll, I'll let you decide, could she be one of those women artists who we might want to call great? I would think so.